everyone, I'm Christina Kerr from Neighbor Media at CCTV, and tonight on my right I have Ian Samuel, a lawyer, and we are going to focus on constitutional crisis. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, Ian, you um, work at Harvard? Yes, I teach at Harvard Law School. And um, for uh, a young man, you have a really astounding resume, and we could do wow. a whole... That's very nice of you, thank you. Yeah, we could do a whole segment on that, but... Um, not today. Not today, not but today. you have done interesting stuff and worked for interesting people. So, um, all right, I'll tell you how this came about. Mm -hmm. um, during the election and then afterward, I kept hearing the expression, a constitutional crisis. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really, I didn't know what that meant. And it seemed like people were throwing that expression around as if we all knew what that meant. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say it's fair to say it's an expression that gets thrown around a lot, yeah. Does it? Because I, I had never really heard it or maybe I just, Maybe it just gets thrown around a lot with lately. With lawyer, yeah. okay, yeah, with, that's what I mean, mm -hmm. lately. It seemed like it cropped up and people would just throw it out there and make it seem like a dire thing but never really explain what it meant. And um, So I was wondering to myself, am I the only one who mm -hmm. is not understanding what th this is and it sounds very major? Mm -hmm. So I decided to go ask other people mm -hmm. if they knew what mm -hmm. a constitutional crisis was and so mm -hmm. we did, and we have a clip of um, mm -hmm. four simple questions I asked them, mm -hmm. um, which I'm going to ask you. Okay. I'm going to guess because I don't know the actual definition, but I would say a constitutional crisis is when people in power are violating the Constitution on the grounds of being in power. A constitutional crisis is when there is um, there's a disagreement on the way that the Constitution is written or understood, and so what begins to happen is that it begins to break down the original intent of the Constitution. So we need to go, so it would be, actually the crisis would be worse than having to make an amendment or an act or anything like that. It's not, it's not anything that's amended, it's something that disrupts the original uh, documentation itself. Constitutional crisis? Yeah. That's when the country's in chaos in its own way. <laughs> For whatever reason, cause it, I have, you don't always know, or you might have an idea. But most of those chaos are stuff because the government's messing around with each other and messing around with other governments and then, then whatever. Do you think America is headed for a constitutional crisis? Yes. Yes. I would guess yes. And how do you solve a constitutional crisis? I would hope that the Supreme Court uh, holds it. That, that's where it has, that's our only recourse is the Supreme Court. The solution has to fit the problem. I think a lot of people go for like impeachment probably. And that's, I don't know if that's always the best solution. You overthrow the threatening power. What is the official definition of a constitutional crisis? It's not really a term that has an official definition, but I would describe it as, and I think that most lawyers would agree, it is something like, a situation where you have a disagreement about the legitimacy of the governmental structures that we have. In other words, you have something more than just disagreement about what is the wisest policy. And in fact, you have even more than disagreement about what does the Constitution mean? Because we routinely disagree about what the Constitution means. That's not what we think we mean by a constitutional crisis. We mean something like a, a disagreement that goes to the whole legitimacy of the government. So I think that a lot of people would describe, for example, uh, the Watergate 
crisis, as a constitutional crisis, because it went to the very legitimacy uh, of the presidency, um, his sort of actions with firing the special prosecutor and the congressional investigation, things like that. That would be an example, I think, of something people would commonly describe as a constitutional crisis. Okay, so we survived that. We did. So um, basically, the next question I had for myself and other people was, um, have we ever had them ha had one before? It it sounded like such an apocalyptic situation. Oh, and it can be. I mean, because I think the other example I would give is the events leading up to the Civil War. So we had a fundamental disagreement in the United States in the middle of the 19th century about can states secede from the Union? The Constitution doesn't speak to that one way or another. It doesn't say they can, doesn't say they can't. And so leading up to that, we had a fundamental disagreement, and that one was apocalyptic. Obviously, it led to the Civil War. Um, so they're not always so peacefully resolved as Watergate was. Um, so, yeah, I think we've had things that didn't go so well. Yeah, and um, some of the people I asked, they thought that was how you ended a constitutional crisis, was through war. Sometimes. So I, I happened to run across a website today that said, technically, we've had five. There were mm -hmm. some simpler, Watergate and Bush versus Gore. Mm -hmm. Was that considered... I think that that's an, another example people m you might get if you asked. Mm -hmm. uh, the nature there, of course, not just that it was a close presidential election. We've yeah. had lots of close presidential elections. And not even that the winner of the popular vote wasn't the winner of the Electoral College, because we've had that before and now we've had it since. But it actually went to this question of, you know, what was the official result out of Florida going to be? What electors were going to show up in the Electoral College? Because there was discussion at the time that the Florida legislature might just vote to send a slate of Republican presidential electors, kind of regardless of what happened with the recount. Had we gotten to, down that road a little further, I think that would have been a genuine constitutional crisis. Bush v. Gore kind of didn't get quite that far because, you know, the sort of Supreme Court's resolution was accepted by everybody. But Doesn't imagine that seem a little constitutionally crisis? I mean, I don't know the Constitution. I did try and read it before mm -hmm. I interviewed you. Um, there's fascinating stuff in there, really. There's a lot of good stuff in um, there. And you really, it's like a civics lesson. It is. And, um, it's, and it's meant to be read by anybody. It's not, but it's not a lawyer's document. Yeah, no, you can actually, there's plenty of, it's... Absolutely. Yeah, you can read it in layman's terms. But um, the Supreme Court sort of making that decision, that, that wouldn't be... Considered. I would say that that averted what, in my view, was a sort of bubbling crisis. But yeah. imagine what would have happened if Al Gore had said, instead of what he did say, which is the Supreme Court has made their decision, and I very much disagree with it, but I accept it. Imagine if he had said, I don't accept it. Yeah. The results of that decision are not legitimate. I am the winner of the popular vote, and I am going to assume the presidency. That really would have been a full-blown constitutional crisis. Oh my gosh, and we could have had one in this recent. We could. Ima <laughs> no, imagine if Hillary Clinton had said, Right after the election, I am aware of substantial information indicating that there has been foreign interference in this election. I am the winner of the popular vote by some three million votes. I am going to assume the presidency in January. And Donald Trump had said, no, you're not. That would have been a genuine crisis. And then a lot of people actually did want her to do that. So had she done that, what do you envision? Would we have gone to civil war? You know, it's it's. I don't think I'm wise enough to see something like that and know how it would play out because we've never had anything like that in the United States. I know that uh, in other countries, when they have had uh, contested elections where both sides can't accept the result, uh, political violence is often not far behind. And mm -hmm. I think that's exactly why Secretary Clinton, because she did not want that, uh, that kind of political violence, uh, she decided to accept the results of an election mm -hmm. that I'm sure in her heart she believed uh, or maybe not entirely the product of ordinary political processes. Right. Well, that's a good segue because, um, so thinking about the constitutional crisis, I mean, first there was, uh, you know, the immigration stuff, but in a way, from where we stand today, it seems like the Constitution is, you know, dealing with the immigration bans and mm -hmm. stuff. Here's, here's where I think of the constitutional crisis. Um, it is the Russia stuff. So um, we're going along merrily, but we have this nagging thing of Russia mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. possibly invading our election and Trump, Pence, and um, third fella, mm -hmm. little fella. Flynn? No, I don't know. third in succession. Uh, 
Oh, Ryan. Ryan. Paul Ryan. Speaker they all seem like they have a little bit of dirt on them in that possibly, probably, whatever. Um, the mm -hmm. crisis, to me, that's where I see a potential constitutional crisis. Mm -hmm. There's two things people seem to want for us to be able to revote because there does seem to be mm -hmm. illegitimacy. Mm -hmm. Hasn't exactly been proven, but there's a lot of smoke. Mm -hmm. Are we headed for a constitutional crisis in that department to tell you the with truth, the Russia stuff? I don't think so, to tell you the okay. truth. And the reason that I don't uh, is for a few reasons. The most important of which is uh, there is not evidence and there has never been an allegation that uh, foreign interference constituted, for example, altering vote totals. Mm -hmm. uh, the interference that's alleged, and I think very credibly alleged at this point, is, uh, for example, various uh, you know dissemination of hacked emails, things like that, mm -hmm. a sort of propaganda campaign. Yeah, the, this of, of the sort that is not unfamiliar to the United States. We've done you know things that are not dissimilar in other countries right. too. Uh, if there had been, for example, credible allegations that say the uh, voting totals in Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania had been altered uh, through malfeasance by some foreign actor, that really might be a different story. But because we don't have that, what we appear to have is a situation where information was disseminated at the behest of a foreign government or with the aid of a foreign government, uh, and it caused people to sort of make up their minds in the election. In a what about way. the possible collusion part? Like, I mean, if if it's actually proven that it was mm -hmm. that the Republican side knew mm -hmm. in advance of this plan, I th mm -hmm. constitutional crisis. Well, Who? what I would be curious about is so, for example, the FBI has an active investigation as do the House and Senate. Uh, the trouble, of course, is that the president has the authority to remove the head of the FBI. It's hmm. his constitutional authority As to be able to do that. he's threatened to do. Um, now, he, has, he hasn't done so yet, but you yeah. could imagine a situation where, say the FBI was investigating and they concluded that in their view, laws had been broken during the presidential campaign. And the president said, well, we'll see about that. And he fired Jim Comey and whichever deputies uh, wouldn't go along uh, with the revised course. That really might constitute, and then, you know, let's say uh, the Senate and House investigations are, are stymied or something like that, that really gets us closer to that territory because mm -hmm. there, again, it goes to the whole legitimacy of the executive branch. If you can't trust um, that the lo criminal laws will be enforced in an even-handed way because they implicate the president, that does start to get more sensitive. But we're not anywhere near that yet. Well, Thank if goodness. we ended up being very near to that, what do we get? Uh, a room full of constitutional lawyers such as yourself with a lot of experience to um, tell America where to go next? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I have a feeling that given my understanding of the, the nation's views of lawyers and law professors that we might not be the first people they would turn to in a crisis. Uh, I think what we, we've seen something like this. We saw this, uh, we mentioned at the beginning, with Watergate, where there would be enormous pressure for a special prosecutor or a select committee. Perhaps then the focus would shift to the House and Senate, because after all, they have a constitutional role to play in the removal of the president. And if there were really sort of criminal uh, misbehavior that were proved, you would imagine there would be enormous public pressure for impeachment. Again, that's not a constitutional crisis in the normal sense because our constitution provides for impeachment. Well, I think I was thinking crisis in if all three of them at the top and then you had to go to whoever the fourth choice is. But sure. You know what, Ian? Tell me. Time flies when I'm with you. Oh, wow. Thank you. And our segment is done for the day. But we need to have you back because oh, you are a very accomplished fellow. Well, that's very nice of you. I very and much enjoyed being here. You could here. take up a whole hour with all your accomplishments. Well, I'm sure your viewers will hope that I do not. Do you have like a website or something that you want people to check out? Uh, I would just encourage people to uh, follow me on Twitter, where I okay. love to uh, endlessly express myself. It's just at iSamuel on Twitter. Okay. So, Samuel, it yes. was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. strong. This is our challenge, keeping the vision of liberty bright. For without it, we are surely lost. This 
is the challenge. As compelling, as severe, as crucial, as Americans in any age have ever faced. My guest for our next segment is Rachel Benedict, who is an immigration attorney in Cambridge, in East Cambridge. Where's your office? My office is in East Cambridge, exactly, right by the Leachmere Stop, 189 Cambridge Street. Okay, have you been there for a while? I have. I've been there for a little bit over a year. And I also am a part-time supervising immigration attorney at a domestic violence agency called Harbor Cove in Chelsea. Okay. But usually I'm in East Cambridge. Okay. So you've been busy lately. Yes. Um, and um, there's a lot of issues with immigration. Yes. And we could probably talk all night, but we don't have sure. all night. But um, one thing we, we just, the update right now is we're kind of in a holding pattern as far as the immigration ban because of the because judges. of the travel of the, the travel, travel ban. ban. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So um, for now, that's kind of in a holding pattern. But the reason I wanted to talk to you tonight is um, Obama was often called the deporter in chief. Yes. So, and then Trump's been doing what he's been doing. I I kind of want to know a little bit about that. Sure. Um, as an attorney, immigration yes. attorney, is, from your perspective, is there, ha, is there much of a difference between the, the yes. Obama? Okay. Yes, there is a difference. So, um, yes, many, many deportations happened during particularly Obama's uh, second term in office. Um, there were some priorities issued. There was a memo issued in 2014 which directed um, the Department of Homeland Security, um, Customs and Border Patrol and ICE as far as which immigrants should be priorities for um, removal, deportation, removal. Um, and so um, at the top of the list were recent and recent entrants folks who've made re recent entries, mm -hmm. entries into the U.S., also folks who had um, criminal convictions, and also folks who have had outstanding removal orders. Um, that covered a lot of people. That included children who entered recently, who entered mm -hmm. post-2014, mothers and children who entered post-2014. And remember, criminal conviction doesn't necessarily mean you go to jail. Do something really bad. It, well, you could mean it often meant for for my clients and other lifting. folks I saw. Shoplifting, right? Shoplifting or um, uh, OUI, which I don't want to diminish the seriousness right. of that, but it's you not could, murder. Well, it could be murder. I, I mean, it's certainly something we should take seriously, but someone could be, um, if they're in Massachusetts, they could have um, admitted to sufficient facts, been placed on probation and thought that they were okay, and then been um, arrested by ICE and put into removal proceedings. And then, so yes, many, many deportations happened during the Obama administration. Well, that agenda sounds exactly what Trump said his agenda was for who's going to go. But I mean, okay, so uh, so why? There, but why? there are some, can I, should I tell yeah. you what the differences Yeah. Are? Okay, great. Yeah. So, so what, President Trump has said are a few sort of conflicting things. One thing he said is there are no more priorities, right? Okay. So during the Obama administration, um, I had other clients and other immigrants I knew who didn't fall into those categories, who let's say they um, had been in the U.S. for many years. Um, they had violated immigration law. Let's say they worked without permission. They drove without a driver's license, which is a crime, but not considered a, a grave Mm -hmm. crime or it's a crime in Massachusetts. Um, they were not priorities for removal. So even if they were 
intercepted by the Department of Homeland Security, um, the guidance was to not arrest them. Right. Okay. And even and if they were placed into removal proceedings, the Office of Chief Counsel, the prosecutors for Department of Homeland Security, um, they had a lot of flexibility to use their prosecution and close proceedings for folks who weren't a priority. Okay. okay? Yeah. So tr President Trump has said now, on the one hand, there are no priorities. Everybody is equally a priority, right? So ICE, if you find someone without status who's ever violated immigration law ever and remember folks this is not just you know sometimes people think oh central americans who come across the border this includes you know anyone who's come on a student visa and mm -hmm. worked uh bartended you know and made cash under the table um it's a whole host of folks um so all of those folks are priorities for removal and if they are intercepted by customs and border patrol or ice they should be um and they're removable they should be arrested and the um, detained, right? And they should um, be put into removal proceedings. And similarly, the Office of Chief Counsel, their guidance now is to very, very rarely join us to close or to terminate removal proceedings. So they're they're just like grabbing them up, throwing them over the border where Obama you know, kind of went case by case story, you know. Well, for under the in the Obama administration there were priorities, there was guidance as far as which folks ICE and should spend its energy on. Right. Um, I, I we haven't seen big raids. Um, so I wouldn't say you that they're big. Seen big no, raids? no, we haven't seen big immigration raids and I don't I don't because know that, that I, will I do recall like um, under the Obama administration, a couple of times in New Bedford, like strangely, there were some strange big raids of ICE going under Bush. Under Bush. Oh, that was Bush. under Bush. Yes, yes, that How was under Bush. How dare I? Really? That okay. <laughs> yes, that was under Bush. Believe you, me, I remember those raids. Let me ask you: Do you think? So I was confused about Obama being deporter in yes. chief. A, I why go that route? Because what I had always heard is. Um, People coming over the border, it was at its lowest level ever lately. Yes. Why do you think he chose? Did he deserve that moniker, by the way, from what, as a lawyer, immigration lawyer? Yeah. I mean, the numbers yes. are there, I guess. Yes. My other question was, are the numbers deceiving? Is it possible that a lot of that happened at the border and it just added up to big numbers? Well, a lot of that did happen at the border, but that doesn't necessarily That's, diminish the gravity right. of what happened, right? Okay. So. At the border, and this is another difference between Trump and Obama, yeah. uh, between their administrations, there's a proposal to expand the use of something called expedited removal, which right now is only used at the border, which includes the physical border and the international section of airports, okay, including at Logan. So in an expedited um, removal process, the Customs Border Patrol or ICE officer serves as both the judge and the prosecutor, right? Asks a few questions is supposed to ask whether or not the person has a credible fear of returning to their home country. There are a lot of problems with this. There's oftentimes folks are not actually asked, or if they're asked, their proper answer doesn't get recorded. There are cases of three-year-olds who are allegedly interviewed by Customs and Border Patrol officers mm -hmm. and then say that they came to the U.S. to work, right? Um, I yeah. haven't met that many three-year-olds who can yeah. put together that sentence in any language. So. Mm -hmm. um, so under the Obama administration and right now, expedited removal happens at the border and at, 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 at the border, basically. So there's a proposal to expand the use of that um, to anyone who has been in the U.S. for two years or less. They can't show that they've been in the U.S. for two years or more. So that has to go through a um, notice and comment period that when it was proposed um, in one of the orders, it was in... Um, I'm, trying, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember if it was one of the orders or one of the accompanying memorandums that went with the orders, but basically it has to go through notice and comment, period. So that hasn't happened yet, but that's going to be awful. So to make a long, to come back around to your question, yep. mm -hmm. just because a uh, removal happens at the border doesn't make yeah. it any more grave. It means there's mm -hmm. less to due process that happened. Yeah. So whether it happened at the border or whether it happened at the interior I guess because I was of just imagining cases. that they just stopped them before they actually cro I mean crossed over the border I I don't understand why he would have um, made this you know such a big um, item on his agenda 
Well, what was he getting pressure or I mean, what I do you know. think? Well, I mean, there are some theories. I mean, unfortunately, he's never. Did, we President don't have. Ob we don't Obama have, come talk to me and explain. I know, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm asking he's a never, lot of you. He's never, he's never explained to but, me. But there are proposals. Well, we don't have much time. But yeah. give me one of the theories because well, I, I sure. am perplexed by it. Sure. So one of the theories is that he wanted comprehensive immigration reform to go through Congress, and he thought that the way to build the political will to do that yeah. was to um, crack down, remove a lot of folks, and crack down on the an border. An optics, an optics and thing. And then um, there would, that would help build the political will for mm. comprehensive immigration reform, which it, which it didn't. And then, right. And then he tried with deferred action for parental accountability or DAPA, and then of course that didn't go anywhere either. So, so all right, uh, we're, we're pretty much out of time, okay. but do you have any advice to anybody on anything? I mean, in this situation, like, I, I don't know. I, this well, is... everybody pay attention to the news. Be careful where you get your news. Um, if you are an immigrant or if you care about immigrants, we, meaning the Community of Immigration Attorneys through the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and the PEAR project, we're doing Know Your Rights trainings all over the state, all the time, in English and Spanish and Portuguese and Haitian Creole, all, all kinds of languages. Can that be Googled, Know Your Rights project, or is that? Um, you can, I think you can go to the PEAR website and find out um, where those are being coordinated. And if you want a Know Your Rights um, training to be at your school, at your workplace, at your church, at your mosque, there have already been many in Cambridge and in Somerville then contact PEAR, there's a coordinator there, contact them, and that they can um, help you to schedule one of those Know Your Rights trainings. Can you for spell free. that? How, how are they spelling that? Uh, PEAR, it's um, P-A-I-R. They're a provider of legal services to folks seeking asylum and other immigrants. Okay. Yeah. Rachel, I appreciate all the hard work you do. I know you've Thank been you. so busy. And thanks for coming in sure. and talking to us. Thank you. Bye.